Everybody, welcome back to Southpaws, the show for leftists who love sports. As always, I'm your host, Adam. I'm joined by my co-hosts. I am Maurice. And I'm Nathan. Happy to be back. Down the hatch, folks. Well, there's been a lot of action in D.C., a lot of action on the field, on the court. So let's jump right into it. This week's Power Play. Up first this week, an extremely dishonorable mention to Bill Belichick. It was announced that in a last-ditch effort to look important, President Trump was going to be giving Bill, the coach of the New England Patriots, the Congressional Medal of Freedom. Uh, Trump and Belichick, they do go way back. Uh, Trump has said he's a very good friend of mine. He's a winner. Uh, Trump told Hugh Hewitt during a radio interview this August, you know, if I ever had a military battle, I'd call up Belichick. And what do you think? What do you think? Give me a couple ideas. Uh, Belichick has never been a, a military man. He is a football coach. It's not war. Belichick has uh, decided that he will be declining uh, the award despite having openly supported Trump most of Trump's career. It seems to be in line with what people are expecting uh, from reactionary shitheads that get caught wearing shirts that are extremely Islamophobic, uh, depicting carnage that the U.S. military has reigned around the world. Uh, liberals like Dave Zirin right here uh, telling us that this is actually good. Bill Belichick is a smart guy. Uh, he would never make mistakes like this. We need to just move on. So guys, uh, what do we think of Bill here? Well, I, I do agree in the fact that like, all this proves is that Bill Belichick has a working brain, you know, which kind of makes him the Einstein of NFL coaches. You know, like did did his heart change? Uh, absolutely not. In in no way. Like he still is a Trump guy, but like he saw the with which way the winds were blowing, and he changed course and he decided not to take uh, the Medal of Freedom. Um, so, you know, he, he shied away for a moment from reactionary views, which also makes him the marks of NFL coaches, in my opinion. You know, not to defend Trump here, but there are some links between the military and the NFL. Um, there's hella physical trauma in both of them, hella PTSD as well. Um, but as far as people and them saying that this isn't surprising of Belichick to sort of denounce Trump here, I am surprised because every week it seems like Trump does something that people say is irreconcilable. And that people say is irredeemable, but then the next week people forgive him anyway. So it is kind of surprising that of all things, this is what finally did it for a guy like Belichick. Even if it's not how he actually feels, if even if it's mm -hmm. just how what he's doing publicly, I am still a little bit surprised. And that proves his heart didn't change because this is the thing. It wasn't anything in the previous four whoa, years. Whoa, it was whoa, this whoa, thing. Whoa, whoa, whoa! We got yelled at. We I'm got done. yelled at by the commissioner. The commissioner of Southpaw has yelled at us. This last week that we keep Adam over Silver? the timer. I, I, it could be. It's you know mysterious dark forces. <laughs> which is A why, figure. Which is why I'm going to be respectful of their wishes and I'm going to take an overtime right here. So smash uh -oh. that fucking button. Uh -oh. boop, 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 boop. Yeah. I, I totally agree with Maurice here. Uh, this is this whole turning on Trump with the last ten days or whatever we're at this impeachment bullshit like. It, it's all just so hollow, and, and and Belichick clearly has no regards. He just knows what side his his bread is buttered on. Same with guys like Dave Zirin, though. I mean, Dave Zirin has just made a career out of taking taking guys who have past that that should be totally questioned, and and have showed a pattern of abusing people like his Kobe a eulogy stuff like that. Like he just you know it's it's just these liberals are just ready to move on. When what the fuck are we moving on for? They they spent four years claiming that this was the end of the world, and they're just like, oh well, I guess you know it wasn't that bad. Like the people who perpetuated it, like they're all good inside. Adam has been itching to do that. So, <laughs> so just to be clear, Dave Zirin is not coming on the show. Never, not anymore. Never. Okay, <laughs> it's not, yeah. You can send I, I this to sure. him. Send it. I'll I'll have friend of the show Ken Klippenstein uh, send this to him now that he's at the intercept. All right. Well, enough about shitty football coaches. Let's get into shitty baseball coaches. Talking about Tommy Lasorda, 
Uh, Tommy Lasorda is currently burning in hell now after 93 years on Earth. Uh, he did win four NL pennants. He did win two World Series. What I'd like to remember right now is Tommy Lasorda denying that his son was gay, denying that his son was dying from AIDS, cooking up some half-baked story at the end of this, at, near the end of his life, about how like once at some glad fundraiser he said gay people weren't that bad or that his son was gay don't really know nor really give a shit because fuck him to be completely honest you know much was made this week about his attachments to dodgers how he was the epitome of the dodgers way how he just loved the dodgers so fucking much and when this did come up, as it did uh, in, in, in outlets, was covered better by OutSports, uh, SB Nation's uh, gay-focused uh, blog. Uh, but it, most of it was stuff like this New York Times article, just describing Tommy Lasorda as troubled, a troubled man. So guys, uh, you know, what is the legacy here? You know, for me, I think it's really interesting or really fucked up, rather, that guys like Dick Allen who are legendary and iconic players and personalities don't get to enjoy the accolades of the hall of fame while they're actually alive, but racist, homophobic piece of shit, white men like Tom Lasorda get inducted 20, 25 years before their death and they get to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Uh, I, that, that shit really pisses me off. And for that reason, I'm really happy that he's dead. The only thing I think that I sort of am upset about is the fact that A, he lived a life so long and B, he didn't die a much more horrific death. Strong words, strong words. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want to take the most charitable view, I like because there's this nostalgia around Lasorda, big nostalgia. And like, I guess I can kind of see it from the thing of like, he was a character and now there are no characters because baseball has turned into a cold, soulless, algorithmic, you know, monster. Um, but if that's really what you're after, and maybe a lot of people are like that, Lasorda is not your man. You know, get into Dick Allen, get into the, the steroids era. That was good, clean fun. There are plenty of other things, characters in baseball, if that's the reason that you lionize Lasorda. So I can kind of get that, but. Do do man, he's dead. Bye bye. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, there's just so much, so much that happened there, so much homophobia, so much inexcusable behavior that, uh, you know, a place like the New York Times went out of their way to go find people to excuse the behavior, and they asked, uh, they asked, you know, gay gay players to to reify the man and and say it wasn't that bad, and it's just fucking disgusting to me. So. Let's move on. Bye bye. Well, in much better news, people who are still alive as they don't have raging homophobic hate in their hearts. Willie O'Ree being celebrated by the Boston Bruins, first and foremost, retiring his number. Uh, Willie O'Ree, of course, is the first black hockey player in the NHL to ever lace up the skates. Uh, not only is his number being retired, but he is being celebrated during Black History Month. The NHL will be placing decals on the back of the helmets uh, to, to continue to celebrate his contribution uh, to the sport. Uh, Owe has been finally inducted into the Hall of Fame while alive, like I mentioned, <laughs> uh, in 2018 in what many people had viewed as a kind of an ultimate disrespect to his contribution. It, it was just such a long time coming. People just made excuses for, oh, his, his career wasn't that long, blah, 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 like without looking at the reasons for the numbers. So, uh, you know, I just want to take a look here at how people are reacting. Friends of the show, uh, Black Girl Hockey Club is reminding us, just like Maurice was with Dick Allen, that we need to give black people their flowers while they're alive. Thankfully, once again, Ori is alive. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is great to see. It's great to see that he's going to get to celebrate that with uh, the Bruins and uh, also outspoken black activist uh, JT Brown has been celebrating O'Ree's accomplishments uh, while currently playing in a league that allowed someone like Don Cherry be the face of it for so long. So this is great stuff, guys. What do we think? Yeah, it's great. Um, something people may not know. O'Ree was also blind in one eye. 
Uh, so that's even more of an incredible accomplishment. I don't really know of any other. I'm sure there have been, but not many other athletes who have ever uh, done that. Um, like you said, uh, thank God he's still alive for once. Uh, they get to celebrate uh, someone, uh, you know, a, a trailblazer gets to celebrate while they're alive. Um, and last thing was very funny. He actually said that the the racial abuse he got was worse in the U.S. than Quebec. And that's saying something, folks. Quebec in the 60s, that's saying something. You know, originally um, what I wanted to say for this segment was uh, to shit on the NHL for empty handed gestures to black folks, just like they do to Native American folks. Um, but I want to ignore that because I think that this is ultimately really cool for Ori, even if it's not necessarily for the whole community. I think he really, you know, feels good about it and made him, uh, you know, uh, it made him feel good. And ultimately, you know, that's, that's cool. That's enough for me. Black folks having their joy is cool. I'll take it. Beautiful. Great. Less than a take away. Well, back into the modern world, the COVID world of sports, Kyrie, Kyrie Irving of the Brooklyn Nets, who had been sitting out for quote, personal reasons for a week or so video surfaced of him partying maskless. Looks like it was for a birthday party, possibly for his family. Mm -hmm. uh, he's now being investigated by the NBA for violating the COVID protocols. Uh, Wodge, uh, dropping the Wodge bomb on this, uh, <laughs> reports that... Woj. Uh, it, it's, you, know, you can say how it's Polish. You don't have to respect... Go ahead. Go that, ahead. Don't let me stop opinion. you. He, uh, he reports that Kyrie really does serve to lose an assload of money on this one. Uh, as if you get caught violating the COVID protocol, that is money out of your pocket. Making uh, this whole thing kind of wilder, to me at least, is that Kyrie was also spotted on a Zoom call uh, with Cynthia Nixon in a big event uh, for progressive justice reformer, district attorney candidate, uh, Tahini Abushi. Uh, this was after the video surfaced. So uh, Kyrie, of course, gives quite a lot to charity, does a lot of work there. Uh, so this is just an interesting development to me that this is what he's up to on his personal leave. So... Guys, what do we what do we think here? What is Kyrie stand to lose? Well, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but I really kind of get tired of folks blaming individuals, even in uh, sports like this. Ultimately, it really pisses me off that the that the NBA decided to go without a bubble, and then also the fact that they're even playing at all. And I think that that's where anytime stuff like this happens, the focus for me is always got to be on the league itself for forcing these players to play a contact-ish sport uh, during a, a pandemic like this. That's that's very true. I like to make fun of Kyrie, but I think George Hill, another player, was like, um, if they're, you know, going to cut us off like this and, and make us live this way, maybe we shouldn't be playing, which is a very good point. And after all, Kyrie was at his sister's birthday party. Um, he, he is so fascinating to me because he does one thing that you just... It, it blows your mind and then he does this charitable awesome thing and you have no idea he's so perplexing to me and i actually have more to say about it because i know the mini minutes coming up so let's hit that power play on Kyrie. whoa 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 hey, let's do it <laughs> i think uh we've talked about this uh how you know you don't want to talk too much shit on Kyrie, except to say that I would hate to be his coworker. I would hate to to be in a professional setting with him. And speaking of, James Harden got traded to the Nets, which I'm super excited about. Imagine if the late era uh, uh, Kobe and Shaq, where they wanted to just stab each other with pencils. Imagine if they had Twitter. This is what it's going to be like. This is They're going to win the NBA. They're not going to lose a single game. They're going to win the championship, and they're going to hate each other the entire time. It's going to be wonderful. Tune in, folks. Let's fucking party. Well, uh, talking about activism, uh, people taking a look at the world of politics from the world of sports, D'Angelo Russell of the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves, during his presser, took the opportunity after being asked a question about the recent riots in the Capitol, to turn it into a group session, uh, asking everyone else how they felt and, and saying he had a little bit of time. So let's, let's check out what they had to say. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not in any rush right now. I think it's the perfect time to do this. We've got 
We got John, Dane, Britt, Jace, Chris. I, I'd like to get, get you guys' opinion first, and then um, we can play it that way. Guys, what did you think of this? What did you think of the responses? What did you think of the way that he kind of turned this? Like, wh- what did you think? I loved it. Um, I think there's a cottage industry in the media, especially with all these protests happening, that they can get easy, cheap, easy quotes by asking these you know, athletes who are clearly in pain what they think about it. I love turning it on them, you know? Uh, they had sl- maybe slightly better responses than I thought maybe they'd have. I can only imagine like if a John Rothstein was there, you know, and they'd be like, John Rothstein, what do you think about, you know, the Capitol raid? And he'd be like, uh, uh, Iona's game has been canceled. Uh, I don't, <laughs> anywho, that's my John Rothstein bit. I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I really found the whole thing to be sort of unnecessary. I get where D'Angelo is coming from for sure but I don't know I it, it was kind of unnecessary to me like for me it's like what do you get from it what did what did I get from it from watching it and I'm not really I don't know man it's not really hidden for me but what I will say is that we're coming up on a minute right now and I think I'm gonna have to do the uh the overtime right now oh okay okay hit play my music let's, uh, let's, let's hit the button it. Dane Moore is a guy who covers the Timberwolves and he was at that conference with D'Angelo and what he said was in regards to the white supremacists uh, raging the Capitol, he said, for me, it's embarrassing as a white person. And I understand that statement. Truly, I do. But there's just a lot of, to me, underlying white guilt behind it. And that white guilt is always it just always rings so, so shallow to me. And I think that white people should be ashamed of just being white. Like you don't have to have like a specific scenario or situation and say, man, <clears throat> right now in this moment, I feel embarrassed. Like, no, you should be embarrassed at all times because you are white and whiteness is destructive and embarrassing itself. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, my one contribution to this discussion would have definitely been that it felt very strange uh, like I thought it was a good move by him to do this because I think it really highlighted the kind of difference in expectations between the two professions. Uh, you know, it's he's expected to have opinions on any sort of moment because he's a black and a an athlete and b an athlete. And these guys whose like job is to cover things like are not expected to have these opinions at all, which is just insane. So I thought it was yeah, I thought it was interesting at least. Uh, I don't, I don't know how it turned out, but it was definitely interesting. So. Well, and a little, little bit of story that's a little outside where, you know, sometimes we usually go. Old fans of the show might know that we do touch on the hair a little bit. Uh, I'm talking, of course, uh, that the German Bundesliga was accused by the German Hairdressers Association, uh, some form of labor union or bargaining unit, uh, to uh, the players getting haircuts and forcing them into situations where, as hair haircuts have been suspended during the covid uh, protocols in germany they're being forced into giving black market haircuts because nobody could have a haircut that good without a professional doing it and it's making people feel like they need to get a haircut in their opinion uh they're saying they're saying that uh people are notice taking notice and it is they're just asking for a little bit of labor solidarity guys what should we expect of these athletes should they get haircuts I think that there is a very long storied history of uh, white supremacy infringing on the freedoms of black hair. And I think it's about damn time that white people get in trouble for their hair as well. So I'm all for this. Whatever, whatever penalties need to be uh, placed upon these young men for going out of line during a pandemic and taking care of their hair, I'm, I'm all for it. I just wish they had put somebody on blast where they'd be like, take this guy, for example. His hair looks like shit. This is the right way to be doing it. This is the right way to be living and just totally shaming somebody. You're a white guy. You just get a bowl, you put it over your head, and you just just raise her. Just raise her in a line. That's all you need. It's a pandemic. Get a bowl cut. Let's bring it back. I just want to say, South Paws, I am encouraging. I am standing in, in, in unity. With German hairdresser association, I've not gotten a haircut since February. So, oh, we know, we know. Well, you know, I'm on, <laughs> I'm on Me TV every week, 
promoting solidarity with the great people who cut hair every day for everybody else. And I stand, I stand with the union. Well, it is the NFL playoffs. This week, we saw the Browns defeat the hated Ben Roethlisberger. You know, we don't really watch football here on Southpaw, so we can't really offer you up very much analysis. Thankfully, Means TV, we do have someone who can. Little Diesel of the new show, Lil Lion's Den, that has premiered its first season on Means TV recently. is great, very wild, very, very cool stuff. Um, he's here. We have him in the studio, and uh, he's going to give us a little breakdown of what happened this weekend and what's going to happen coming up against the Chiefs. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, boys. Uh, I'm Little Diesel for everyone who has never seen me before. Uh, I'm just here to give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of Cleveland perspective because our Browns are are doing pretty good, actually. Uh, first thing. Uh, I want to I want to mention I don't want to cut any corners. We're talking about Big Ben, big surly bad nasty Ben. Uh, you know he looks like my brother. He's got those big knobby, stiff Frankenstein body, an old old body. Kind of looks like my my father. He, he's kind of like a demon broker. And, and Big Ben, I tell you from a Cleveland standpoint, it was it never felt better than to watch Big Ben cry like that on the bench. He was so tall, just crying there. And uh, yeah, and, and moving moving on, I, I guess I, we got to touch on some comments that were made by some uh, other Steelers, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, who, who I don't know if you heard about, we beat them on Sunday. Some of the Pittsburgh Steelers, JoJo Smith Schuster, uh, before the game called uh, called the Cleveland Browns. Uh, they, he said the Browns is the Browns, and we're a bunch of nameless gray faces. And you know, <laughs> I, I tell you, the entire city of Cleveland took that personal. <laughs> are not gray faces it actually the only gray faces i see the only gray faces i know are the ones that stare and hover over me at bedtime when i have my little sleep problems the night terrors and and another thing i want to talk about very shortly is bernie kozar bernie kozar is a browns legend he never made it to the hall of fame he never made it to the Pro Bowl, and he never really got any honors, period. He's a pretty bad quarterback, but Bernie is sort of a king in this town. He's tall. He's also really tall. You need to be tall to be a quarterback in Cleveland. It's the AFC North type of thing. But Bernie does these mortgage uh, commercials, uh, kind of like a super villain. He does these mortgage commercials in Cleveland radio stations, and his new catchphrase, it's not really catching on, folks. His new catchphrase is, you matter. And, and, I, and I'll, I'll be honest, you do matter. And, and I, while I have the topic of mattering, I need to, to mention something really pretty sad, and it kind of took the whole city by surprise. It was kind of like the 9-11 for the city of Cleveland. Swagger is the name of our mascot dog. The Cleveland Browns mascot is a dog named Swagger, and he passed away last year. And we weren't sure if the city was going to overcome it. We weren't sure if we deserved to overcome it. But next in line, and you can see it right here, folks, next in line to his fallen father is SJ Swagger Jr. to carry the torch for a new Browns era. And that's all I got in the Browns, folks. I just want to mention we have a show on Means TV called Little Lion's Den. Please stop sending us rice and lamb again. My co-host is very sick. Please stop sending us rice and in the mail because we took all the episodes off YouTube. I'm so sorry they were on there for free, folks. Back to you guys. Back to you, Adam. That was great. I know I'm definitely now very excited. I might even watch the game. I'm I'm very excited for the state of Ohio, which is that's the first time I've ever said this. So I just wish I had drugs while I was listening to that. I think you've heard one win one for the Gipper, uh, and that's stupid because it's about Notre Dame. But winning winning one for Swagger is, I think, a very real thing and a very beautiful thing. And I'm glad it happened. And we usher in uh, the Swagger Junior era with a uh, Browns Super Bowl, hopefully. So I'm rooting for you guys. Thank you, Little Diesel. Well, uh, thank you very much, Little Diesel. That is inspiring words. I am 
absolutely fucking juiced for this week's playoff <laughs> now uh, featuring the Browns. We're almost here at the end of the show, but you know, there's always one last thing we got to do. Of course, that is who said it. All right, boys, you swept me last week. You're not sweeping me this week. Okay, so. I got my broom on standby. Uh, you're not, you're not taking out, the, you're not touching that broom. You're not even looking at that broom this week. Uh, so here's what we get. Um, the, the first person on this list, some people, he has many different titles. You know, some might call him, uh, you know, a, a congressman. Some might call him a patriot. Some might call him the wrestling coach at Ohio State when they went through a sex scandal involving the sexual abuse of dozens of wrestlers. Whatever you want to call him, his name is Jim Jordan. Mm. We know Jim hate that Jordan. Guy. Hate, hate that guy. We hate we hate that man. Yeah. And yeah. uh, who is he being lined up against in the trenches this week? Who's that? It's Joe Paterno. Uh oh. Jim Jordan Yikes. versus Joe Paterno. A lot of J's in there. Are we ready, boys? Q in there. A lot of Q in there. A lot of ready. Q. A lot of J's. A lot of Q. Joe Pa, and Joe pa is spiritually Q. He's a spiritual. <laughs> he's spiritually Q. I think you'll find that with a lot of these quotes, yes. Okay. Um, and if I didn't explain, we have three quotes, two guys. I am trying to stump the boys. I give them quotes. They have to guess who it was. Okay. Ready to go, gentlemen? Get that broom out, baby. Okay, your first quote. We live in a world that takes guts, integrity, and conviction. And we have a president in George W. Bush who has all of that. Ooh, do you think? I think he's trying to trick us. He's trying to... Why Jim, would... Because Jim Jordan is is like more recent. That's a good point. They're also very well, similar. My, I was going to... I was going to guess Jordan. That's what I'm leaning towards too. I'm I'm struggling to remember Joe Pa like openly campaigning, but also he was like kind of like he was only like he was only lucid like at the very early stages of my football watching life. So uh yeah, let's go with Jim Jordan. I'm with you, Maurice. Okay. Who said that? It was Joe Paterno. <laughs> All right, Papa Joe. Thanks. Uh, a big Republican, uh, liked like George W, like George H W, was a fan of them both. Um, so now you know. You sh you could have guessed. Anyway, second quote. We ready? Sure, ready. <laughs> I did uh, guess, so <laughs> I could not have. <laughs> <laughs> Maurice, how's that broom looking? Anyway, I can't second find it, quote. Se of course, now you can't find it. Second quote. I have an interest in trying to make a difference for families. You become more aware of how important families are. They are the key institution to our culture. It does seem like Jim Jordan. I feel like he's a big I worked really hard this week. <laughs> I feel like I feel like Joe Joe Pa was never he never recruited like that. Like uh he he was always kind of silent but like i said i don't i can't i don't have a cognizant thought of joe pa literally saying a word i only <laughs> just remember mumbling him, on the sidelines I mean, is right i only remember him fucking dying because he didn't say anything <laughs> at the end of his <laughs> life so wow. I, I don't know man i these what these guys are like two they're they're just a vibrating on the same wavelength yes they the, are the, the family the family thing makes me think of jim jordan though because I feel like family is something that is emphasized more in within like wrestling communities than even football communities. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Interesting point. Interesting point. I agree. Uh, my friend who uh, who does uh, help kids get recruited in football said that there is nothing more that a college football coach <sighs> loves than a single mother. So, because they like to just replace well, your family. So, there's also a whole lot more black kids in football. That's a whole nother story, though. Yeah, yeah, let's not get too in the weeds. We're saying Jim Jordan, lock it in. That one's Jim Jordan. That's Jim Jordan. There we go. Um, mm. Jim Jordan okay. and Joe Paterno, notoriously great for families in their past history. Right. Okay, here's the rubber match. Are we ready? The idea that I wouldn't stand up for these athletes is ridiculous. 
I feel sorry for the guys, the fact that they aren't telling the truth. <laughs> I think that's Christ. Jim Jordan talking about the... Because <laughs> cause Joe Pa, the kids that got molested were not football players. And, and Jim Jordan, the guys who got molested were football or were wrestlers. Yeah. I'm going to go with Jim Jordan. Lock it in, Jim Jordan. This is the darkest JJ, fucking baby. one we've ever done. That is Jim Jordan. That is Jim Jordan. I wanted to tell everyone how big of a piece of shit he was, but you won. You won. <laughs> I don't feel good about this one. This one is I, uh, very. This is exactly what I was worried about with this segment, and it is. It's coming like a like a well. Dark I, I I felt a, I felt a kind of way about Jim Jordan this week. I promise you, the next one will be lighter. You can keep you can keep me to that. The next one will be lighter. But uh, yes, Jim truly, Jordan's a real piece of shit. I mean, that I felt something in my soul uh, this week, and I, I'm not sure all, that people really know that about him as much. So now you do. Everyone, every everyone we do on on this segment is like a war criminal, a white supremacist. <laughs> so like, how 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 much but, lighter? But, can well, we but, but, <laughs> but like, uh, but like, but like a humorous war criminal, like a like a you know oh, yeah. sort of like a white supremacist thing, light. You know? Yeah, like a, a uh, diet uh, white supremacist. Like a, You're going to his that kind of guy. You're going to his iron <laughs> direction with this one. Would you Would you tell Jim Jordan to stand up or sit your ass down? What would you yeah, do? Let's, 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 we like for the this anthem? segment out at this point. All right, let's move on. I'm ripping on Zyron too. I thought you wanted solidarity. <laughs> if ripping on Zyron. Well, that's all the show we got for you this week. Just a reminder: all of 2020's back catalog is now free on me and TV. So if your friends have not subscribed yet or are on the fence or just want to check the show out, let them know that they can watch some of the old episodes, get hooked, and become subscribers. Um, also, shout out to Lil Diesel again. Thank you for that excellent synopsis on the Brown season so far. And Go Browns. Until next, until next week, we'll see you guys Go, later. Go.